Hey, everybody. Welcome to an absolutely glorious episode of Jeff Has Cool Friends. Hey, I'm Jeff May, and uh, you saw the title. I have cool friends, and I'm very excited to have this very, very, very special cool friend joining me today. Uh, writer, artist, podcast host, which... Get out of my lane. Uh, <laughs> Riley Brown. Riley, how you doing, bud? Good, man. How are you doing? Oh, good. good. It's good to see. It's been too long. <laughs> it's, it's been two days. It's so funny. You are on my list of people to go after. And then we literally were at PowerCon relatively recently. And yeah. uh, spoiler alert, I was like, what the hell are you doing here? I, wa I want to know because PowerCon is a Masters of the Universe. Uh, it's a He-Man convention. Right. And so I was like, uh, oh, did he work on one of the Masters of the Universe comics and I didn't know about it? No, no. not at all. I, I had no right or obligation to be there. I'm just a huge He-Man fan. And um, uh, and like you said, I have my own podcast. And uh, in July, when the new cartoon was coming out, we um, used that as an excuse to have He-Man month. So we interviewed a bunch of He-Man uh, contributors in various ways. And one of them was Val Staples for all his work he's done, mm -hmm. um, including hosting and founding PowerCon. Yes. Uh, he was uh, also so, well, a, a comics, uh, an artist and in his own right, I believe. Correct. Yeah. That's how I know him from uh, the days we worked together, coloring various comics for Marvel. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, at, when we got to talking and he was just like, Oh dude, you've got to come out to PowerCon. I'll have a table for you. I'll have a um, I'll set you up in a hotel. And I was like, okay, you don't have to twist my arm, man. I'll be uh, there. And what, so what, that was it. I, I was, I was very excited, uh, to see that because you and I, we have this history where we've crisscrossed paths in so many different ways Yeah, where it's just wild to me because we first met, um, I believe officially around 2011 to 2012 to which I liked your work and I had you do a sketch. Is that when in, I was working on Hercules, I believe? I, I believe you were working on Hercules, yeah. yeah. Well, that's which I was I... Hercules, which was Hulk, right? It was like Hulk. And yeah. then it, it, they took over as being Hercules, even though it Except was the Hulk. Except when I drew it, it was Thor too. <laughs> it, was when th uh, uh, it was when Hercules was dressed as Thor for a storyline. It's for whatever reason. That, that was really that was fun. fun. Yeah. Um, but we met you did a sketch for me and my I have an ecstatic sketchbook based on the Peter, Peter Milligan yep. and Mike Allred, uh, my favorite ex title of all time. And everybody <laughs> hates me when I say that. And I don't give a d and people that's, were, the, that's the right attitude when you're an ecstatics fan. I think. People were so mad about that book because it, it was oh, it yeah. basically took over like the Rob Liefeld X Force right. like sort of style and replaced it with this very subversive <laughs> pop art like sort of deconstruction of of the x-men and it was like all these fans were just getting a hair across their ass about it and i'm like oh so you don't like like um like an allegory right. you know, like well, anything you know. <laughs> anything below the surface and that's a problem with i think a lot of fans of pop culture is that they are very blind to anything below the surface that they see there's a lot of i mean it was you know it, it was a brilliant book and a lot of people do say that it's one of their favorites I do understand where the pushback for it comes from just because like, you know, when you're continuing a certain, cause it started off as X-Force. It was just the regular X-Force mm -hmm. book. Then all of a sudden they get rid of all the X-Force characters and it's a total change in tone. So in a way it wasn't quite fair to the regular fans of Cannonball and Domino and all those guys. So, you know, they're, they're right to be mad, but uh, at the same time, it still turned out to be a pretty brilliant comic. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard when a book's not selling. And right. they're like, we got to reboot something. We got to try something. And they basically turn it into what can best be described as like a vertigo book, like an indie, a dark indie yeah. book, but with an X on the title. It wasn't, it wasn't really dark. It was kind of indie. But I didn't, it's, wouldn't describe are it you dark. kidding me? I don't know. It was very like brightly colored. There's a lot of like okay. MTV references. You're right. It is uh, purposefully brightly colored. Yeah. Because it is literally the darkest X-Men book that's ever been written. The whole point uh, about it is like everybody is going to die. Oh, that's true. Like, I forgot about that. Nobody is it's been safe. a long time since I've read it. So, if, yeah. I know this isn't your book and I shouldn't I have really gone too heavy <laughs> into this. But for any of you that if you ever want to uh, read the Peter Milligan, Mike Allred X-Force slash Ecstatics, you'll get what we're talking about. It is yeah. it, it's super dark. So you did that sketch and we were like buds or whatever. And then in 20. 
2013, I ran into you at, I believe, uh, LA Comic Con, the Stanley's Kamikaze or something oh, that, like that. I've never been. Or, to that oh, no, it was San Diego in 2013. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, 2013 or 2014. And it was, uh, I was doing an interview with you about Power Play. Yes, that's uh, right. We did an interview about Power Play. It was a really fun interview. I will link to it uh, in the comments if I can find it. It was back when I uh, had worked on and created that that hashtag show with all those other guys that were great. Um, it's a really fun interview that I believe the last thing is you telling me that you hate me. Uh, <laughs> and it's very good. Yeah, and we've held a grudge all these years. <laughs> so, so you did power play, and then sort of like as cons have grown away, it's just we see each other every once in a while, and it's great. Uh, I told my co-host from Tom and Jeff Watch Batman, Tom Ryman, um, about oh, I'm recording with Riley Brown, and he goes, oh, Marina and I have a commission from him by Deadpool. So Tom and Marina Ryman commissioned a Deadpool with you, and I believe they're like social media friends with you. Yeah. And then, of course, the power con thing. So we've just like had this like weaving crisscross, um, which sort of explains the title of my show. I have cool friends. And like as you meet more people, that that friend sort of net starts getting thicker and, and more full. Right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, it's pretty cool. And also, you know, you're not so uncool yourself. I <laughs> I was uh, dazzled by your constant one liners at PowerCon. You always like no matter what anyone said to you, you were so quick with a response. I was just like, I got to just write down what this guy is saying. This is the best dialogue. And it's just coming off the top of his off the top of his head. It's crazy. I'm good at like three things. And like yeah. that, oh, that, and that might be one of them. Uh, talking, well, that's good that you have a podcast. And well, it's also, but it's, it's talking on the fly because like uh, planning, which I do, I do a lot of research. I do a lot of planning. A lot of it just goes out the window because yeah. like, I'm, I'm very reactive. Even when I was a boxer, I was a counter puncher. Like I'm okay. not good at like, I'm really good at like the, the volley of conversation, but yeah. like sculpting and like stretching out a plan, I, I, it always falls apart. Okay. Which so is, I would, just... I would kill to have the other skill. Right. Th those are the people that have houses and like <laughs> all their teeth. Yeah. The people who plan ahead. <laughs> yeah. People that yeah. are like, this is something that's going to be an issue in five years. I should start dealing with now. I was never that person. Right. Uh, I was more like the, hey, quit, quit. And then they're yeah. like, and we have to pull the tooth. And I'm like, ah. Well, so I, I was, do, I do a lot of research as I do. Um, a couple of things we're going to start. Uh, I'm not going to do this in a linear fashion because I want to first talk about you are uh, the artist of what I, I don't know how to describe it other than the fastest selling comic of the year. Um, yeah. This I thing mean... is wild. Batman Fortnite zero point. Uh, with right written by Jeff's cool friend Christos Gage. Oh, you know Chris too. Chris is awesome. Oh, he's a Worcester guy. Oh, okay. I mean he's cool. my like we would watch we because we both lived out here in L.A. We used to get together and watch Patriots games together at a oh, wow. at a small. Yeah, he. I mean, he used to like we both shopped at the same comic shop as kids. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. shout out to that's entertainment in uh in Worcester. But so, you Batman Fortnite Zero Point. This became this. I don't know how to describe this because I can't I don't want to do anything that makes it sound insulting. But oftentimes uh -huh. video game tie ins are not what you would consider to be like something that immediately sells out. It usually becomes something that's like, oh, well, they got this license and they had to do something with it. Right. This thing exploded. It was wild. Like, honestly, I when, when I took the job, I had a feeling about it. I don't really know why. I didn't have that much information going in other than Batman Fortnite. And I was kind of like, well, I mean, I know Fortnite's one of the biggest video games on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's popular with younger kids. And one of the my things recently, like when I try to think about what projects I'm going to take, I'm always trying to expand my audience and also aim for a younger audience if that's possible. Mm -hmm. You know, like I try to aim for that like middle school, high school demographic the cool um, so kids kind of, yeah right well that's all the stuff that i really <laughs> loved when i was a kid was kind of aimed for that uh that's kind of stuck with me over the years and um so i was like okay i think this has an opportunity to hit an audience that you know will able to be able to grow up with my artwork and so i thought that was pretty cool but 
you're absolutely right that so many video game tie-ins, and this is something I was kind of looking out for. I didn't want it to just kind of be a, a product. You know, so many video game tie-ins are just another piece of merchandise for the video game mm-hmm. that never ties into any of the comic book continuity, doesn't tie into the video game continuity. It's just kind of like a weird, quirky thing that happened at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and But all credit goes to Donald Mustard with this. He's He's the creator of Fortnite, and he was adamant that this is going to be the real deal like this is like he wanted to tell the story of Fortnite and all their secrets and stuff like that and he's just like the video game isn't the right platform to tell this story you know obviously they have little bits here and there but you know it's a big free-for-all game there's no storytelling mechanism to it so but he's a huge comic book fan huge Mm -hmm. batman fan and he said a comic book would be the best way to tell the story and who better to get to the bottom of the mystery of Fortnite other than the greatest detective on earth batman it's what's interesting about this book, and I'm I'm going to steer clear of spoilers on this because the hardcover just came out, uh, right. which I have. I did buy it because I could not get the floppy copies. I wanted to yeah. read it because several of my cool friends made it, and I couldn't get it without paying an exorbitant amount of money. Um, so I've read it. Here's what I will say. First off, brilliantly, and this this isn't this isn't about you so you can tune out uh <laughs> brilliantly written in a way that how could you make a free for all game make sense um in a narrative perspective and it does and it does it very well um so shout out to Colonel Mustard well, that, that's his name right <laughs> Donald <laughs> Mustard no. shout out to Donald yeah. Mustard and Christos and Gage and Christos Gage of course I'm um, for doing that um the art is really really good it's clean uh you really knocked it out of the park I really love that, but it it did it right in a way that not a lot of any kind of video game adaptation. You know, like how many times have you seen like a good video game adaptation in anything? Yeah, not like not often. I, I've got a few like I've got this. Yeah, it's not too often. I've got this Legend of Zelda comic from the 90s that I love. The Acclaim. It doesn't really tell the, the Valiant, Legend of Zelda. The Valiant, What's that? the Valiant Comics, Acclaim Comics ones? No, it was. It originally ran in Nintendo Power. Um, and a few years ago, Dark Horse put out a nice collection of it. Okay. Uh, I love that comic, but it doesn't really tell the Legend of Zelda story that well. You know, like no. I, the comic artist, I don't think. You know, I think he read like a strategy guide or something and actually played the game, had the character designs. So it's a great comic doesn't really tell the video game story mm-hmm. that well and a lot of them are like like the better ones are kind of like that but it's they just kind of have to be sometimes right like you um, can't there's a bunch of street fighter comics that are decent um but it's like you know those are just essentially character designs that you can play around with it's, yeah um you know and like most of the team ups with you know major superheroes and stuff like that just don't they, they don't click and i think with this one i think one of the reasons it's so strong is that it's hard to do a cross company crossover that's part of continuity that but i think we still managed to figure out a way to make it feel like it counts especially with all the batman catwoman stuff i mean it it really does feel like a bleed out from what tom king built in the sort of the dc rebirth run exactly like even if you know like I, okay it is one of my goals at dc to eventually draw the bat cave and have that lineup of um bat costumes and put the 0.1 in there to officially make it official (laughs) that this did happen in continuity but it's you know it's hard to make a crossover like this really happen in continuity because it feels a little different when it first comes out but i think we made it feel like part of the regular series by like if you're reading Batman right now and you were to read this, it would fit right in. And it's kind of a story you want to see with Batman and Catwoman. It's mm-hmm. sort of like it picks up a lot of those threads, does something totally new with them and cool. And um, it's easy to get on that ride. And, you know, if you read it, I think, you know, if in 10 years people consider it part of continuity, I don't know. But if you read it, you're going to want it to be part of continuity. It, and there's no reason that it can't be. It's great. Uh, and there is such a mid-series surprise character <laughs> that arrives. And I will not, you know, again, I don't want to spoil it. Also, I want to add that the the hardcover for all six issues is relatively cheap. Um, that I don't know why DC put it at such an affordable price point, but it's like the hardcover is 24 bucks. 
Yeah. I get I get twenty uh, percent off uh, at uh, House of Secrets in, yeah, uh, me too. in beautiful Burbank. <laughs> so it was like I paid under twenty bucks for this beautiful hardcover book. Question: it, the, the the print design is amazing too. It's it is great. the 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 dust jacket is really cool. Yeah. Um. So that being said, there uh not the first time you worked with Christos Gage. Uh, you worked with him on Amazing Spider-Man uh, when you did the Avengers Academy stuff with Spider-Man and all that. Yep. So my question to you is now, how how was this packaged and sold to you? Was Christos like, I got a guy? Were they like, let's go for these two because they work well together? Like, how did you get onto this project? Like, how did you specifically get chosen for this? Um, I don't really know the whole entire story, but I think that our editor Katie Kubert just presented Donald Mustard with a bunch of artists um, to pick from and he liked my artwork. And so that was that. So you weren't um, bundled together. This just happened to be that you worked with somebody that you have already worked with previously that worked really yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, that's yeah, wild. I, I, yeah. I really hadn't even talked to Christos in a while. So, well, cause he's um, a bad cool person. To... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's, he's insufferable. But, well, an, um, an interesting thing, too, is that he himself is a video game writer as yep, well as comics. Yep. So that as well as a million other things. Yeah. yeah Hawaii <laughs> Five-O, ladies and gentlemen. Right. <laughs> and then uh, Daredevil. Is that how you pronounce his name? Daredevil? <laughs> I'm being told Daredevil. Yeah, with Matt Murdock. <laughs> uh, Matthew Murdock. Uh, <laughs> classic. So um, you actually I, I've noticed when I've gone through sort of your 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 history in in the work that you've done with a lot of stuff is that you you do have these certain writers that you seem to work really well with that yeah. you you work multiple projects together, um, including what seems like uh, as far as I can tell, like your first major Marvel penciling work, which would be Cable Deadpool number twenty nine. Uh, I, I, it was one. I thought it was twenty eight. I think I'm right. Uh, but, but anyway, it, it was I, somewhere I, around that. Yeah, right before Civil War. Yeah, the, the Marvel database has you at twenty nine. Uh, there, as there's the one, one of those where they mixed up the credit. So it's, I get there's this one comic that I've been played with my whole career where people bring it up to me to sign. I'm like, I didn't draw this one. Uh, then there's just, one that I did draw that doesn't have my name on it. That or it's inside but not on the cover. I don't know. It's, fair enough. Whatever. But um, if, with so like it, it Fabian, uh, is it Nicieza? Is that, Fabian Nicieza. Nicieza. Yeah. yeah, I always I know him and I still screw up his last name. I'm a bad person. Um, you that, got it right. You, that, got it right. <laughs> you worked with him. Uh, the number 29 cover, uh, Mark Brooks actually yep. had done that cover. But that was back when he was um, more of like the Marvel age kind of style of drawing that sort well, of like before the, he did fully painted stuff. Yes. You know, former guest um, of the other pod. That we no longer talk of, Mark Brooks. We like Mark. I think I get sued if I say that. Yeah, you don't don't have to butter him up for me. I, I mean, I well, I mean, I like I him. The, I know the truth. I like him for doing my show. I don't like him as a oh, as a person. Of course, uh, right. And he makes good pictures. Um, but so so you worked there, and then your your history, like your publishing history, the stuff that you've done, and you've really found yourself in a lot of really cool books that have been almost far more appreciated years later than they were at the time could be i guess if you're looking at sales they're they're, they're well remembered books i think um when they come out they're not always the big hits but yeah you know unless you're doing the big crossover or amazing spider-man or batman or whatever mm. like the sales are not always so great but um but they're ones that like are usually fan favorites you know like people still come up to me with copies of cable and deadpool just raving about how much they loved that series back in the day um and the hercules story even though i was only on it for a few issues like it, I, it was one of my my favorite stories ever to do and it seems like it really hit a chord with the fans it's um, that's one of those things where people really like the, that incredible hercules story that that run in general it was so unique to being in a hulk book and being hulkless and sort of being like about that and having hercules sort of take over yeah it is wild. It's become this like massive cult hit. Yeah, totally. Uh, for a long time, it was. Um, and so, and so, well, anyway, like you said before that, uh, Fabian Nicieza, I worked with a bunch on um, Cable and Deadpool and various other Deadpool projects since then. And currently we're, we're working together on Outrage. Outrage. 
I, that's what um, I, that's where I was going with this is that yeah. you, you guys now do what looks like a creator owned project called outrage. Right. That's right. Which, um, it, it's totally free on webtoon right now. Um, we're having a bit of a hiatus. I took a break to do the Batman Fortnite series and, uh, why, but no, I'm just kidding. cause I, <laughs> cause I couldn't draw two comics at the same time and deal with the pandemic and all the children and everything. Yeah, no, so, that's a, um, that's a real, that's a real thing. Yeah, there was there's a whole life going on. And I it kills me to have to to had to have put the project on pause, but it um yeah, it is what it is and we all move forward and you know, I'm working on it now for any fans that are outraged at me for halting the outrage. Uh, it's coming up. I'm working on it. It's on my desk right as we speak. So, so now it's a matter of time. Is the, when you're doing outrage for webtoons what is is this like a passion project is it as as financially rewarding as say like a deadpool comic like if you're doing issue to issue how do they compare like for like paying your bills well you know without getting into all the specifics of the contract and stuff uh marvel and dc what they pay isn't all that difficult to beat if you're looking to hire a creative team from one of their comics um so yeah i'm i'm not making less money that's for sure right. do you, how much plus i have to say just creator owned is an amazing thing as well yeah. um because now we own it and we are actually very soon to launch a Kickstarter for the printed version of Outrage because it hasn't been in print yet. It's only been digital on Webtoon. So, and do you do you draw now purely digitally, or do you do you still do the classic um, pencils? It's almost um, all pen and ink. Okay. Um, I do my uh, I do layouts on my iPad and then I print those out and pencil and ink from there. Is I, I'm wondering about that because there's a question that I have about about comic artists now. Which is, I know a big part of paying your bills is actually selling original art. Yeah. Like, that's a significant part. Like, you know, each page you get, your page rate from a company might be worth something, but like might be worth whatever, whatever it is per page. But then selling, say, a, a, a double page spread of Deadpool, for example. Right. I mean, you can be thousands and thousands of dollars if it's the right the piece or, or, or from yeah, the right book. Um, and a lot of artists consider the original artwork to be their 401k, you know, mm -hmm. like in the future, that's what's going to get them to retirement when they have arthritis and can't draw anymore. Um, so to me, it's really important to not, to try to get everything on paper so I can have that actual art thing to sell. I was wondering about that because I know some people that work digitally, but then I'm just like, but what do you sell afterwards? And I know, I know it, that, um, I think Yannick Paquette through Bob Shaw at Comic Art House, they're doing like essentially one of one digital prints that are like like guaranteed stamped as like this is the only one that exists. You're buying the original art. You own right. this. It's yours. Which yeah. I um, some people do that. Uh, and, you know, there's some fans that are into those things. Um, some people. I mean, honestly, since I don't do it, I don't entirely understand yeah. the business model. I assume that they can, if they're working digitally, they can draw twice as fast or something like that. So they're producing twice as many pages and get paid more. And so it kind of works out. I don't really know. Um, I know some people will uh, do it digitally and at least like do a, you know, traditional version of the covers or the splash pages or whatever to get um, you know, the stuff they know they can sell for a thousand dollars or a few thousand dollars. Uh, it makes so sense. Yeah. Some artwork there. If you're doing like um, a, like a, like a talking heads issue, like a page, you might just do it quickly digitally. But then if you're like, and then it's Spider-Man fighting Wolverine and Deadpool, you're like, okay, well, it, I'm going to put pencil to paper on this one. Exactly. I think that's how they think about it. Like if it's just a bunch of like, you know, if it's Aunt May and, you know, her landlord arguing over the rent or something like you know nobody's gonna want to buy that page or, <laughs> or at least not for such an amount that um it's worth you know, your it's time. not worth it just yeah. yeah doing it faster so i don't know uh i'm not such a good digital artist that it would speed me up that much more mm -hmm. um maybe i mean i don't know uh, there's a lot of things to consider i like just drawing with pencil and ink and it kind of any day where i spend the whole day like on photoshop or whatever I am kind of miserable, so I'm not eager to make that change, but you know, 
<laughs> we'll see what happens. See, here. your your whole verbal thought process right there is my verbal questioning process about this same thing, which is like, okay, like, why would you versus why wouldn't you like, is it the resale issue of that? You know, like, and, and so it's, I'm really appreciate you sort of being candid in that regard, because I do think about that. And I know a lot of times artists don't really want to talk about like that aspect of the financial part, but it, it is a job, right? You know, and it, it's sort of like if somebody like is booking a stand-up show, and you're like, "Well, what's the rate?" And they're right. like, "Oh, well, well, we're not really paying." And I'm like, "I got to do. I got another job that pays me that I have to do." Yeah, you can't do everything just for fun. And no. if you do it for fun, it damn well better be fun, not work. You know? Agreed. Um. um so now, in the same regard, like g- doing conventions there's got to be some sort of like the the opportunity costs of that as well, which is like you go to a convention, you do commissions and sketches and you can make a good amount of money. You know, it does it ever come to the point where like, have you ever had conventions where you're like, this was not worth it? Oh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I keep track of how much I make at every convention so that, uh, when, you know, when I get invited to conventions next year, I can look up how, how much did I make there last year? and um see what it was because it's funny each convention is sort of its own animal and the fans there might like different things like some conventions reliably like you're just gonna sell a ton of prints you know like people yeah. don't want to buy any original artwork uh it's like there's a price point they don't want to go by but they love that you know 10 to 20 dollar print window mm. and so you know i'll sell 100 prints in a day and that's great um then other conventions, you're not going to sell many prints at all. Everybody wants sketches on those blank sketch covers. And so you got to be ready for that. And then other conventions, they just want original artwork or pages or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I kind of try to keep track of that and see what fits for me. What, uh, what was PowerCon for you? What was the He-Man convention? Because it's not a traditional Comic-Con, but you are uh, a traditional comic artist. Right. It was mostly just an excuse to go to power <laughs> really? to be honest okay um, well that's I that's got, fair yeah but i was just wondering yeah. like what the lion's share of of um the business uh, aspect of it was for you um probably uh, uh commissions i did a bunch of commissions mm-hmm. um uh, mostly batman you know <laughs> i don't know uh, there i think there were some comic book fans that were just eager for the, the you know because i yeah I, the crossover you know, is only, clear yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. The um, I usually only get out to California for San Diego Comic-Con. So it's been a couple of years now. And so I think there are some people that were just like, oh, Riley's in town. I got to get something from him, uh, whether it's He-Man or not. Um, I think I sold all but one of my Batman hardcovers that I oh, got. Wow. Um, and uh, I had this I did this gig a few years ago that I just thought was cool. Like um, a friend of mine was involved somehow and it was um, the Amazing Heroes action figure line. It was a Kickstarter. And this guy got the, he got the molds for the Secret Wars action figures from the Marvel super <laughs> or the Marvel action from, figures from Yeah, 80. from 1985, I want to say. Yeah, 85, 86, whatever Secret Wars came out. And he got the actual molds for those and he decided to do a bunch of, um, uh, or, yeah. Like indie he, classic just, he, classic characters, right? But that that aren't like the Marvel or DC, right? Well, the thing is, like most of those molds, I think it was just one mold. I think it was just one body. It's, it's just like a it's just like a guy. It's like a small guy, yeah. like a, yeah, a that four a, then, a five inch guy or something like that, right? Yeah. And then they just painted on him to make him different characters. Um, so he made a bunch of different head sculpts for it and did a Kickstarter to do. He did a bunch of like golden age, you know, public domain characters mm-hmm. and then um, a few other uh, indie cre- uh, indie creators or creator owned creators got their things in there. And I just thought it was cool. So I did some packaging art for it and they pretty much paid me in action figures. So I had like a whole bunch of these that have been sitting around um, and I was like, oh, PowerCon is a toy convention. That'll be a great place to sell those. So um, I sold those and did people uh, did, did those sell? Yeah. A bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think. uh I think there were might have I think I had one left and there was a couple that I gave oh, away to friends. That's but. rad as hell. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I didn't get one. 
Oh, well. Just, all right. Well, I'm going to change right, the I'll name. I'll trade you I'm, next time for that uh, for that little minion uh, <laughs> demon character. Oh, the Hordax minion from Tweeterhead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to say I'm going to have to change the name of the podcast now. That Apparently, we're not that cool of friends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, now, my other question about that, because obviously, um, coming from the PowerCon thing that we just did, you're a fan of Masters of the Universe, of He-Man, yes, or else he wouldn't have absolutely. done this. Like, obviously this is a thing. So my question is, what did you get at the, at the, the, you wouldn't go to that convention and not buy something. That would be a waste of your time in, I think, personally. Yeah. So I, I can feel like you probably got something, but what, what did you get? Um, I, well, I, I have a five-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl at home. So, um, I went, and like, when so I bought a bunch went. of swords. Yeah. so many sharp <laughs> sharp swords. ones um but uh when will was born five years ago i the just the nostalgia just hit me super hard for he-man i was like oh man when i was a kid i loved this because i'd kind of been out of it for a while i was like i just you know um it just kind of brought me right back and uh he was immediately you know from the time he was like three months old and could make any notice of anything he was immediately into superheroes and star wars and he-man and all that stuff i had i and yeah so it's kind of just been like something we've kind of got into together and so nowadays they have all the origins characters so i got some of those for him i got the um and at the same time oh well, i got a bunch of stuff but you have to be careful not to like i don't want to spoil the kid like, i can't just come home with like 20 action figures and no say, but you could do come home and you stash some away maybe for his birthday or whatever. And that's smart. Uh, yeah. So I got him the, um, the, uh, Keldor Cronus two pack because he, he loves obscure characters and he's like, he's always, he doesn't even know the Keldor action figure exists, but he, Keldor is he the character him. that, that eventually will become Skeletor. Right. Okay. Right. Um, it's He-Man's uncle who eventually becomes yeah. Skeletor. Spoiler and, alert for uh, the. I'm going to guess that the majority of our of the listeners aren't going to know who Keldor uh, and Kronos right. are. And Kronos, uh, right. look, he looks That's, like Trapjaw. The, the he's Trapjaw before when he was just regular. I mean, yeah. blue, but just a dude. You know, yeah, um, kind of a dopey looking dude apparently. Uh, and but he flipped out about over that. And then for my two year old, you know, I can't just bring him a bunch of stuff. Um, I have to. Yeah, you have to also get it. Yeah, you can't and, just ignore one of your children, you monster. Right. So I got her a Shira, and also I, like it's really hard to find girl stuff at PowerCon. Um, there's lots and lots of He-Man, but if you want anything else, uh, that might not be the best convention. It, but yeah, I, a, I was able to find some '80s like vintage Care Bear stuff, and um, yeah, so she was really happy with that. Yeah. He-Man, this is boy boy. Like right, it's, right. it's a very well, male centric thing. Um, but of course, She-Ra. Yeah, she likes She-Ra. It's just, you know, there's She-Ra and there's Tila. And then there's not much beyond that. So, um, yeah, and they he, haven't. Here's Evil Lynn. Don't don't right. be, don't be like her. And also well, she she's, already has Evil Lynn. Yeah, so. she's also two. So right. like <laughs> that's true. Yeah, there weren't any stuffed animals. Like I was really yeah. hoping there'd be like a She-Ra stuffed animal or like a plush orca or something like that. Yeah, you can trick a two-year-old pretty quickly. Just bring yeah. like a stuffed bear and be like, "Look what I got at the con." Just I yeah, wanted at the claw uh, machine at the airport or something. I did pick her up a frozen a, a frozen pop-up book on, at the airport. So. Oh, that's smart. Well, I mean, we yeah. were right we were right next to Disneyland. You could have easily right. just walked in at Downtown Disney yeah. and shoplifted something. Um, but yeah, so I got that. I got, um, the, uh, I got picked, I'm, I'm a total sucker for uh, super seven reaction figures. Oh, I got so, a couple myself. Yeah. Yeah. I love their, the worst line. So I got one of those guys. I got, uh, there was some He-Man surprise box things. The blind, um, there were, there are blind boxes. Super seven. For those of you that don't know, super seven is a, a really fantastic, company out of san diego california and they really they've cut their teeth in a big way making what they call reaction figures which are essentially pop culture figures that are if you remember what the old star wars toys were yeah the three and three quarter inch like no elbows you know sitting on a yeah, think it, of it as classic star wars characters but it's like and it's the creature from the black lagoon right it's that size uh and that model of character i i kind of love their like their whole thing is kind of they take 
one brand of action figure and make it in the style of another brand of action figure. So um, like their He-Man muscle men are a huge hit in our house. So we got some of those. Of course. And, um, they got the reaction figures. Uh, for a while they were doing um, He-Man, like guys in the shape of He-Man characters. Oh, that might've only been He-Man guys. But anyway, yeah, it's a very cool company. Um, um, real quick too, because uh, as much as I like to buy things, I also need to... Uh, <laughs> I, I got some stuff myself, but I had to pay for them with money. And the, one of the ways I get money is, of course, on the Patreon at patreon.com slash Jeff May. Uh, if you are a patron, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you. And of course, um, $5 a month gets you all the episodes early, uncensored. And I got a lot of bonus stuff coming at you very, very soon that you can only get on the Patreon. But you also, for the $10 producer credit, you get me to say your name on here. So I have a list of producers, Riley that I'm going to read off to you and you can react to them. You can comment on them. You can mock them. Uh, you know, f them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't mock them. Don't, how dare you mock my fans? You, you rotten son of a, no, I'm sure they're all lovely, wonderful people. They are. They, they, let's be honest here. If they're my fans, they're good. And if they're no, they other fans, taste. uh, neutral. Um, so, uh, this episode is brought to you by the scene in meet Joe black where Brad Pitt dies. Uh, opinions are like holes. Jeff won't eat them. <laughs> I'm just reading this one for the first time. I'm not a fan of that process. I do not. Uh, we had a conversation about it in my Kim Crawl episode. Not a fan. Uh, I'm the law, martial law, and I hate superheroes. Mr. Billy Beck. Sometimes I squeeze Mio energy shots into a monster energy drink. Holy shit, your heart's going to explode, sir. Uh, these are their names. This are are the are names that names? they these are just the things that they paid. They want me to say out loud. Oh, this is where you get to be their puppet. Essentially, <laughs> I will dance. I will dance for just an for an additional five dollars a month, which is not a lot. I will dance like the danciest monkey you've ever seen. Uh, Kimball can't sleep. The clowns will eat me. Uh, get vaccinated, you chuckleheads. The 5G lets you see sound and then you can see your friends again. Let's go. Blackagar Boltagon. You're like the, the first person I've had on here, I think, that I don't need to explain that name. Uh, Big Booty Boy, 42069. <laughs> nice. Russell from Jersey, Pizza, Bagels, Taylor Ham. Bold and Brash, more like belongs in the trash. Real quick, you're from you're a Jersey guy, right? That's right. I'm uh, about some Taylor Ham. What what uh if someone's explained it to me before, but tell me what what the, the heck is that? It's just salted ham that is, I mean, that's pretty much it's it. You ham. put it on a breakfast sandwich. Yeah. Oh, so it's like a whole thing in New Jersey. It's like, we got something everybody else has, but we gave it a name. I Yeah, probably. I don't know. It's very <laughs> New Jersey. Bacon, I usually choose bacon anyway. That's kind of. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. All right. I'm with you on that one. Uh, <laughs> Mef J. I don't think that's a real name. Uh, but then again, hi, I'm Super Fudge and welcome to Fudge Mania. Also, probably not a real name. You, we're almost the exact same age, by the way. We're, we're well, only... no, that's a real name named after Saint Fudgemania. Yeah, uh, it's a Catholic name. Did you read the, the Did you read the the Super Fudge books as a kid? I don't think I did, but my brother was super into because we were in that. That was our that was our purview because we're, we're like I think we're separated by like two months. Oh, really? Uh, I think you're I think you're two months older than me, and I look twenty years older than you. I don't know. I don't know what fountain of youth you fell into, but you look 25 and I hate it. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, craft beers make my alcoholism look like a neat hobby. Uh, this one's great. Jez Butt is going to be a dad. Shout out to Jez Butt. He wow. he he made a baby in a person, which is exciting. Congratulations, Butt. Uh, the Ian McClendon. L, I can't wait to find out how the Maple Leafs disappoint me this year. Seldo. Are you a New Jersey Devils fan? You hockey? Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. big guy, big fan of it. Yeah, eh, I mean, I played hockey all growing up, but much oh. as I follow sports, I'm a comic book creator. I don't. So sports. you you were you were like the the you were like the a proto McFarlane that you played hockey growing up and then became a comic artist. Yeah, pretty much. Why why didn't you make an empire like he did? What's wrong with you? Um, I I should have gone that route. I should have bought a baseball team and made a bunch of action figures i guess god man he made he he, he did he did well uh <laughs> connor known to the state of california to cause cancer benson magnolia thunder 
Excellent. Ah, can't believe you make me say that one. Uh, <laughs> flesh, your friend. Children love the meat Millie. Where's Bane? Classic Dark Knight Rises line. The sad free willy noise. Mm. Oh, that's... <laughs> C2E2 AM Adventures. You ever go to C2E2? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's a fun show. That was my, like, that was where I'd meet up with all my friends across the country because we uh, all met on the Wizard Universe message boards. That's the sentence I can Man, say out loud. I, yeah. Wow, that was a while ago. And then we we all sort of shifted when they broke up. But I met So, so we'd yeah. go to C2E2, get a big, we'd get a huge suite, and then we would, in the morning, get into adventures. C2E2 is fun because it's a convention in a huge city, but it's in the middle of nowhere. So nobody goes anywhere. They all hang out at the bar at the convention center, and it's kind of fun. Funny story is that a lot of us didn't have access to White Castle. Oh, yeah. So we all went out. Another New Jersey delicacy. Uh, The the classic uh, uh, White Castle, as we all as we all know. And uh, I'm not going to say his name out loud, but one of our friends who is a comic artist, who relatively accomplished, did, did Marvel DC, did indie stuff. Um, and we were we went we walked over and s- to put it bluntly, C2E2 is located in an area that is not necessarily what you would classify as terribly safe. OK. Um, and we all went. We were a large group of people. So whatever. But we went to this. We went to a White Castle that had bulletproof glass. In front of the registers, if that establishes information to you. I mean, most White Castles do because most White Castles are in that part of town. Sure, so. sure. Yeah, White Castle is like Burger Waffle House. Yes. Like, like <laughs> yes, you know there's exactly. going to be some shit. So somebody came up to us with uh, the, the can I have $5 for a gallon of milk for my daughter? It is like midnight. Yeah. And I was like, oh, sorry, man, we all have cards. And then this comic artist, because as you know, comic artists at least did for a while before Venmo and PayPal were like the major interaction would carry essentially a wad of cash. Yeah. And so he he took out a wad of cash and peeled off a five and gave it to that guy. What? And I I looked at him. And after that guy walked away, I said, you know, you're going to get us robbed at gunpoint on the way home, right? Like we need to go. And we ended up calling a cab to get us and bring us out because I was like, we're not leaving this building. What the fuck was he thinking? It was, he just didn't, he probably had like a thousand bucks on him. He's a nice Midwestern guy that does, that's never been robbed. (laughs) And like, I've never been robbed, but I know people that have been robbed. Right. I know how to get robbed and how to not get robbed. When a, when a, get robbed, when a giant scary man asks you for money and you take out a $5 and you say, here, let me open my golden wallet with an out. obvious lie. Yeah, with an obvious lie. Yeah. I was just sitting there. I'm like, I'm, we're dead. We're all dead. We're just going <laughs> to die. And that's how this works. Good for us. Um, and we yeah, we we had to uh, get out of there. And it was a scary, scary time. Fantastic. Um, uh, Major League journeyman Don. <laughs> uh, an action figure of Clippy. That's what they should it, amazing heroes. They should make a Clippy or Super Seven. Yeah, Clippy. The uh, is that the paper clip that yes. helps you in Microsoft Word? Yeah, he's a character I used to do on on a, a podcast called The Monday Show, oh, where whenever okay, okay. we'd be talking about something, I'd be like, "Hey, everybody!" It was a whole thing. Uh, crossovers. Uh, the Bollock, Caitlin Binney, um, Superman Family issue number one hundred and eighty four. Kool-Aid Molotov, Lemming Malloy, These Seven Bees, Farty Marty, a.k.a. Fartholomew Martinez, No, Lan Ma Tin, good for him, Cronenberger, Grumblebee, Mike Gouts, Instagrams, at Bob underscore of underscore Skull, a uh, friend of mine, Bob Shaw, I, can, I would guess that he probably has art from you. He's a big, a big original art collector. Oh, I think he, yeah. he has cool. a whole sketchbook that's just recreating the Jim Lee X-Men comic uh, or card series. Oh, my God. That's awesome. So uh, uh, call me. <laughs> I want to do a piece for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll put that. I mean, I know he lives in like Delaware, uh, so he's oh, he's pretty near you. Fine. So it's nice. all 
I'll be yeah. at, I'll be at Baltimore Comic Con. Yeah, you know, so Instagram's at Bob underscore of underscore okay. skull. Hit up Riley Brown. Uh, Saint Gutfree, Funky J, David, Knife Boot, Hinson, Fushizless Jones, J.K. Jeff May's biggest fan. Jokes on you. I don't have big fans. Uh, exploding runes. Dill Havarti. This one was interesting. He told me uh, to put my favorite cheese. And it's Dill Havarti. A unique favorite to have because it's not usable in all situations. But I just, I love a Dill Havarti. What's your favorite? Uh, horseradish cheddar I've been getting into oh, a lot recently. Oh, that's so good. It, yeah, it's got that kick to it. That Oh, man, I love it. But that's another one like Dill Havarti where you're like, it has like three uses like three ways to eat it. You either eat it alone on a cracker or in a sandwich and that's it. You get it. You put it on a baked potato. Oh, that's fair. You know? I guess I don't yeah. eat. I live in LA. We don't uh, eat potatoes. Right. I'm Irish. So we got potatoes but, yeah, yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. You need them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jolly Buckaroo. Normal man. Andrew McGuire. Vortispin. Norm from Cheers. Norm. Uh, Vortispin. Oh, I already said his name. Oh, you have to pay me extra, Vortispin. I said your name twice. Shebrew Sleeps, the ghost of Dave Thomas. Sophia Hapgood's Psychic Services. Russell Richardson, the sass b- stan. It's another character that I created on the Monday show, and it was a b- teenage Sasquatch girl. Nice. Um, <laughs> my dad is the original Bigfoot. Kind of shit like that. He was in Harry and the Hendersons. Uh... <laughs> nice. Riley, show me in the rules where it says a dog can't play basketball. Is that the name of somebody or do you want That's me to somebody's find the rules? Well, I want oh, both. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be an or situation here. Uh, Murph the Murph. Dan Hackroyd. Willem Dafoe's baffling big b- bonanza. Mackenzie Chill. At Nerd Numbers. Ricky Cilantro. Gray Man of the Fireside Chronicles. Blow it all up. That is a disturbing name to have by the way <laughs> that is that is that oh is uh, don't go uh, in the bathroom after that guy uh <laughs> I'm putting down a several bombs so, spoil uh, i have a funny story to tell you though uh, a star wars episode seven story that's related to that specific story so remind me oh of no that. i'll tell you right now uh when i went to see episode seven you know i like waited in my line see it sit down this guy walks in drops a backpack off leaves and he's gone for like 15 minutes and i'm like sitting yeah. there and i don't want anybody to get nervous because I don't want to create a problem and shut down everybody's episode seven thing. But I'm like, hey, is this uh, going to kill us? Is this a bomb? And I'm like, look, and I like went looking for the guy. Couldn't find him. I you finally listen w- for a ticking sound. You know? I, I finally walked into the bathroom and heard a, heard this dude having the worst diarrhea of his entire life. Oh, just like terrible. And he was <laughs> like, like, it sounded a little like he was like crying about it, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> And then I saw him come back in and then grab his bag and leave. Uh, And I was like, boy, is this a a real twist of the story? Yeah. (laughs) That like, I was like, are we going to blow up? And I'm like, nope, just some guy didn't get to see the movie he's been waiting 20 years to see. Right. And yeah, just one stall got blown up. Yeah. Just just the one bomb. And it was his. (laughs) Domo Arigato, Andrew Roboto. The AV Foundry. Spoiler alert, the AV Foundry, my good friend Mike Stanton, um, sent me a ton of um, He-Man action figures that he had. Awesome. Including a Grizzlor with the dark face that I didn't know was a real thing. And then it showed up. It's like a variant. They were like, yeah, there were two different versions. I remember because we had one, but it was different from the one on the back of the card. And I don't remember which one was which. Yeah, but... it's, it's it's a weird one. It's a weird, the dark face one is apparently like it's the rare version. Oh, okay. Uh, wow. I know. I was like, I'm not sending this back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, comb his fur and put him up on eBay. <laughs> right. Uh, seriously. Uh, there's some times where people will send me things that are like pretty valuable and I'm like, ah, I could, I could flip this. But I wouldn't. I, I will. Um, <laughs> Gregarious Gregorio, Captain Fat Strong, Jessica Robertson, at Gavin underscore not with two T's. Uh, Cody Beck Jr., Mind Freak 555, Taurus Bulba, Huey Freeman, Lisa Harden, twitch.tv slash firechild460. Burrito Mouth, Dr. DNA, Steven, Silius Ruby, Kelly Stanaway, Adrian, I didn't kill my wife. 
the most well-prepared dead guy, Jennifer Fendelander, Bart Fartigan, frankly Amish, and uh, last but certainly not least, former guest of the show and very cool friend, Koi Fom, art and mentoring. You All must right. know you must know Koi, huh? Yeah, of course I know Koi. You guys are uh, like practically we, neighbors. Uh, well, not neighbors. He's in Philly, but um, we started like we kind of broke into the industry together. We were both part of Ten Ton Studios, uh, and early on in our careers, we would go to conventions together and. Yeah, just yeah. He's a good friend. Yeah, he's a good buddy. He he is. Uh, he did. He was one of those people with like because the Ten Ton Studios that was a a uh, a Philly Jersey sort of consortium of artists, correct? Kind, kind of, except for it's also sort of worldwide. Like Jason Masters was part of it, and he's in South Africa. Um, and S- South Africa. Like, That's in Philadelphia, though, right? Yeah, South Africa, Pennsylvania. South South Af- <laughs> South Africadelphia. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a message board that we had because let's oh. see I mean, what's the whole origin story. We started off by we just met on the various art message boards that were around at the time, and we got together to do um, uh, we were gonna do just a indie anthology. Just we were a bunch of upcoming artists: me, Koi Fam, Chris Burnham, Jason Masters, a bunch Chris, of other. Chris guys. Burnham's another guy that I got to get on the show. Yeah, he's he's, the... he's hilarious. Good, um, good. Yeah, he's a good bud. Uh. And we, yeah, and we, while we were emailing each other, getting this anthology together, which never came out as many of these indie anthologies <laughs> don't, uh, we just got along so well that we decided to like upgrade from a, you know, crappy Yahoo groups type thing back when that was still a thing. And we got a uh, actual message board. And so then we just started having other, you know, just other random people would find us um and it got pretty popular for a while like there was a time where we had a few hundred people on it every week uh and the most popular thing was the weekly sketch challenge where we would um like someone would pick a character and everybody would draw that character and then we'd like critique it and kind of you know because the idea was everyone to improve their skills and get better Mm -hmm. but the thing is like there was if you won you got to pick someone else's drawing as a prize so there were kind of stakes in it. So it got a little competitive. Oh, cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That went on for years. Oh, I love uh, that. That's like yeah. I, I did a I did a, a Philly show. Um, how much I love that area is like I drove from Portland, Maine to Philadelphia um, just to do one show. And like wow. the crowd. And I, I've told this to you people. Drove? That's a- it's like it was like nine hours. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because we had a wedding in in Portland the day before spent the night there, woke up, and then Valerie Tossi and I drove all the way to Philly for the sh- a show that night. Nice. Um, it was it was awesome, but the the crowd, and I've mentioned this on an episode before, but the crowd was essentially Artist Sally because it was like Koi Fom was there, Tom Whalen, Dave Perillo, Scott Derby, Ian Globinger, um, yeah. Patrick McMullen, like all these like local indie guys that made their names doing really cool shit. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there looking at it and I'm like, I have built the strangest career <laughs> to be like, you know, cause it's like, that's not like, who is it? Me and, and Posein are, are the two comedians that like the comic artists will come and see. And I was like, that's, that's so weird to me. That is that's true. And I've worked with Brian as well on, uh, on Deadpool, Deadpool with, and with Jer- Jerry Dugan, with Jerry Dugan, who yeah. I, <laughs> This is how this is the sort of the interconnecting uh, web aspect of that is I just met Jerry officially for the first time at former guest of of this show's uh, surprise birthday party, Dana Gould. So we were at Dana Gould's surprise birthday party and we're all like hiding. And I look over and I'm like. Jerry Duggan (laughs) He's like, yeah. And I was like, I'm friends with Scott Koblish. You know, kind of a thing. I was like, yeah, we, we kind of know each other. Yeah. But it was like a very, brothers. it was a weird, I was like, I know you, I know this, I know you. And it was, there yeah. was only like 20 of us there total. And I was like, I, I know this guy. That was pretty cool. It was fun. <laughs> um, an interesting book that you worked on that I don't think anybody but me is going to express too much interest in is a book called Slapstick. Oh, yeah um slapstick came out when we were like 11 back the original one back in the 90s yeah uh and it it was like one of those like you know guest starring spider-man in the second issue to get that sales bump and and everything and 
And then the character disappeared and came back during, I believe, the Avengers Initiative. Right. Um, yeah, originally, I mean, when I was a kid, I never read his series. I mostly knew him from the Marvel trading card series. Mm -hmm. I was like, who's the slapstick character? He looks like I'm a, just... what, what, to, the, to, I'll describe it to people first. He looks like a cartoon clown, but in a world of superheroes where even if you were like a live action character, he'd look like a cartoon. Right. Well, yeah, the idea is he's kind of like, a Bugs Bunny character in, and he's drawn in that style in the world of superheroes. So he always kind of stood out um, as just being very different. And then, yeah, he came back in during the Aveng Avengers, uh, the initiative, and he became part of the new warriors. Um, and he was really funny and I really liked him like that. That was a brilliant series. I believe it was Dan Slott and uh, uh, who was the artist? It, it looked like it felt like it was um like a Stefano Caselli or yes, something. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, was Stefano. it? Oh, I I will say that line. It was very. It was a very interesting way to do the character because he basically like snaps a little bit, and it's it was fascinating because he was such a goofy character. Right. Well, they they uh, introduced kind of a dark edge to him, and then um, Jerry picked him up and kind of one of like it was a one off joke in the original series that uh because he was just you know a cartoon character he didn't have you know he was not anatomically correct and it was just kind of a one panel gag but when jerry brought him into deadpool uh, jerry duggan brought him into deadpool that was like his whole thing is that he was super depressed about not having a penis yes and um he and like so our editor, Jordan White, calls me up and says, hey, because um, this happened like right after my son was born. And I was kind of like, uh, like Jordan was like, hey, I know that you're too busy to draw a regular series, but how would you like to write one? Um, we'd like to try you out on this slapstick series. And uh, and that's why Fred Valenti was my co-writer, because he was like, we'll have Fred come in and help you out and, you know, kind of like walk you through this. The not, writing a, not a bad guy to have as a co-writer. Right. Well, and, and Jordan knows that me and Fred are good friends because um, Fred lived right down the street from my art studio in Brooklyn and we'd hang out all the time. So um, yeah, so it was great. And Diego Orlategue, uh, we got him to do um, to do the artwork. And so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so basically we were like, we were looking at him and be like, okay, what's our take on this character? And since it's coming on the back of, it was specifically spinning out of, what Jerry was doing with him in Deadpool. I'm like, we can't get around the no dick thing. Like that's what the character is all about right now. So we have to like somehow weave that in and not make this just about a guy being sad and depressed the whole time. And so um, our joke was that, you know, he's G rated and that comes up a few times. Uh, and he's, you know, he constantly is lamenting his lack of a dingus. Um, and uh uh, so me and Fred would, the way we'd write it is me and Fred would get together at the bar like once a week, uh, just have a bunch of drinks, just make a bunch of like ridiculous jokes. Then after we sobered up, whatever we remembered, we'd write down on a napkin and um, I would go back home and kind of type that up, then send it to, to Fred to, uh, you know, kind of like, like he'd kind of add the dialogue, but we were, it was just kind of back and forth mm -hmm. process. Um, and then in the middle of that, I would draw the layouts for the book and send those to Diego. And then he would, you know, uh, finish them up and ink them and everything. But it was just hilarious and funny. And we really like it was it had never been explicitly stated before, but it was something that I think made our comic more fun was that he was a 2D animated character. Like we were like, this is Marvel's Roger Rabbit. Mm -hmm. He's not, you know, he's not to be drawn like he's in three dimensional space. Um, we want everything else to look pretty realistic, but then he's going to look like a 2D cartoon. Mm -hmm. Like right a color a, form or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, and then, you know, he goes around doing his Bugs Bunny style slapstick humor. But when you do that to real people in the real world, it's horrific. It has you know, horrifying smack, consequences. Yeah. yeah. When you bash someone in the head with a hammer and their teeth fall out like that dude is f***ed up. Yeah. But slapstick is kind of psychotic and he comes off as like a totally crazy character that way um yeah it would and, be like if you're getting yeah. into an argument and cause somebody to shoot themselves in the face 
it's not going to be as funny as right when and it's then, Elmer Fudd. Uh, in the first issue, he teams up with Spider Man, and Spider Man's like, "Yo, you just killed that guy," and he's like, "Uh, yeah, they had a gun and were shooting at us." And he's like, what kind of superhero are you? And um, Slapstick is just like, superhero, what are you, eight? I'm a mercenary. <laughs> like, my job is to get here and kill all these guys and, you know, like, get whatever the thing is they were trying to get. And, um, yeah, so I thought that was a fun take on it. And then, you know, other cartoon characters come in from the other cartoon dimension. And I don't know, it was a lot of fun. That is awesome. That actually is such like a such a, a an irreverent and fun way to do a, a character and to sort of break into that and i i didn't you know in all the things i think a lot of people would gloss over that character because he, he's below c-list as far as how people oh, sort yeah. of view the character but that take on it is so brilliant it was a lot of fun and we were supposed to continue the series but there was like a big shake up at marvel at that time we kind of got lost in the cracks um the uh, the second arc, I think, was Slapstick Assassin or something like that, um, and which was going to get a little bit darker. And ultimately, we were planning on building to a big storyline we called the Infinite Dingus, which would have been uh, Slapstick <laughs> finally getting, you know, uh, it was going to be a crossover with um, like either Thor or Her I think Hercules and some of the Greek gods, because there's a the Greek god Priapus is pre uh, like prayer prism well yeah that's what he's named after he um uh it like he was going to like slapstick was going to do something and he was going to bless slapstick with a magnificent dingus that uh uh we'd never see but we just kind of like i don't know it, it would have been funny but who knows like uh, to marvel tell him you want some infinite dingus tell Maybe him you want me and fred back we need more infinite dingus from slapstick That's well right. um well I, I know we've got to end this episode i'm gonna uh stick here i'm <laughs> this gonna is what we're going out on well no no <laughs> we have i have a couple more things to do but oh, i do yeah. want to say that um for those of you that are listening uh on the patreon we've got a little bit of bonus content coming for you after we wrap up this episode uh we're going to talk about one more thing uh spoiler alert it's going to be lobo um because i i do have some questions about that uh for those of you that are listening for free if you want to check out patreon.com slash jeff may for that extra content as well as the uncensored episodes a week early uh please by all means uh feel free to do that now riley yeah. uh if i wanted to send people to your instagram it is uh also your twitter i believe is at riley r-e-i-l-l-y underscore brown Yep. On right. both Instagram and Twitter. If you are interested in buying original artwork from Riley, which you absolutely should be, you're going to want to check out Anthony's comic book art. That is your dealer, I believe. Yep. Um, right. Now, uh, and uh, we should also say that uh, you do make appearances and take commissions and uh, sketches at those appearances. Do you have anyone uh, coming up uh, after uh, this episode goes up? I do. Uh, September 18th, which is actually probably... That's, that was last weekend. That was last weekend. Okay, so you missed that one. You missed a great uh, signing. I'm you sure. weren't paying attention when I told you when this drops. I couldn't remember. Oh, well, you just <laughs> mentioned it. Whatever. Anyway, um, I will be at New York Comic Con. Oh, uh, wonderful. In October. And then I will be at um, uh, Baltimore Comic Con as well. Uh, so New York and Baltimore Comic Con. So you East Coast convention goers, make sure you uh, hit up Riley Brown. Uh, tell him that uh, you heard him on the show. Yeah, 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 please do. That's um, great. Also, I, I'm going to be briefly at the Big Apple Comic Con, which is also in New York City. I think I'm only going to be there on Saturday. But uh, that um, that works. Yeah. And and again, Riley will give you more of that information across his social media as well. Uh, and you can also, uh, as I'm like, uh acting like an idiot here you can also check out rileybrownart.com for more yep. information as well you see that i did my research i had it up there i had that ready um also uh do yourselves a favor check out batman fortnite zero point uh it is a great book uh, i am not a huge fortnite fan wasn't a problem easy read fantastic book gorgeous art uh definitely worth it um yeah i mean honestly Bat batman doesn't know anything about Fortnite either and i think it kind of <laughs> it makes it easy to read if you, like, you don't need to know anything about it and it might even be a little bit better because uh there are certain things that 
there's a lot of game tropes that are actually like in the world. I don't know. It's yeah, it's fun. Check it's, it out. It's good stuff. Uh, but uh, also, anyway, check out Outrage. Check Outrage. out Outrage, of course. It's, uh, with, it's gonna start totally back free. up real soon. But thank you oh, all so much. I never much. got a chance to talk about my own podcast. I oh, that sh- talk about Hypothetical Island where we can listen to it because I really screwed that up. Oh yeah. Um. So I've got my own podcast, Hypothetical Island, that I do with my buddy George O'Connor, who's another comic book artist. Um, we used to have an art studio in Brooklyn and uh like whenever it was you know everyone's working and george would kind of get nervous when it got too quiet so he would always have these like stupid hypothetical questions he'd ask that just to kind of get the room talking about just some bull and frequently they'd come in the form of you know there's two islands you're lost at sea and there's two islands which one do you swim to and one island is like you know it's essentially one island's the fire the other's the frying pan which one do you pick um, and, uh, so over COVID we were like, we never get to see anybody anymore. So let's just start a podcast kind of as an excuse to talk to our other comic artist friends. And yeah, so that's what it is. So we, you know, we start off with like the first half is usually the hypothetical question, which will be something ridiculous. Like, I think the one we just put out, it's, um, I, I don't know. I don't want to uh, spoil it, but you could see, you'll yeah, check it out. We'll have people check that out. And what I will do is uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, my uh, beautiful, fantastic, handsome, and very kind editor will take what we just talked about and we'll put okay. that in the last episode. We'll squeeze it in. Yeah, we put a new episode out, out every week. We've interviewed some awesome people, like a lot of comic book guys, like I mentioned, but some really great animators. Uh, we talked to Larry Houston, who... Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he worked on like X Men, uh, the animated series. Well, that was the big one, but and, also yeah. GI Joe, Batman, everything. Like pretty much like my whole childhood. All the like, stuff. Yeah, I knew you were involved with X Men. I didn't realize you did all this other stuff. So uh, yeah, we've talked to a lot of great people and have fun conversations that are a little bit different because ours involve, you know, islands full of cannibals and things like that. I love <laughs> it. I love it. It sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, if you're ever hard up for a guest, I'll anytime. Absolutely. Uh, what's the rate? No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, again, uh, everybody follow Riley on social media. Check out RileyBrownArt.com. Riley, you're pretty great. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm you glad too. to. I'm you're glad. Not so bad yourself, Jeff. I'm glad to have you as one of my cool friends, and I can't wait to see you again in the future. Um, cool. Thank you all for listening. Later. Bye. Our artwork is created by Justin T. Brown, who can be found at Artness by Justin Brown on Instagram, as well as Artness by Justin Brown.com. That dope music you heard is by Troy Nababon, available at Troy Nababon on Instagram, as well as at Troy Nababon.com. Nababon is spelled N A B A B A N, and boy, does it.